Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Get out your King James Bibles, okay? Letter as from us, the day is at hand. I got into a disagreement with the brother in Christ over, we'll get to that verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, for it says, as the day of Christ is at hand. And there's some fault, I must believe, I believe there's false teachings out there. They take the word as, and they make this whole study based off of one little word as. Now please understand, um, in the book of John, one word can make the difference, absolutely. If you guys remember, in the New King James Version, Jesus says, I go not up to the feast. And then a uh, in the latter part of that chapter, or the next chapter, he goes up to the feast. They make him out to be a liar because they left out one word. In the King James Bible, he says, I go not up yet to the feast. So he wasn't going to go up when they went up. He, he had plans to go up later. So one word can make the difference. But what's frustrating is how some men can take one word and they, they have this huge teaching based off of one word. Okay, That one word, from what I just said there, Jesus said, I go not up yet, just proved that something simple as he's not going up with them, he's going to go up later, and Jesus never lied. Whereas the New King James makes Jesus out to be a liar. All right? Stay away from the Bible perversions. Get a King James Bible. And if you can't get a King James Bible, email the ministry. I've got a request. Let's see if I can find it. I'm still getting Bibles to Belgium, praise God. Please keep praying for that, Brother Sis Christ. And I got a request for West Africa, Ghana, central region of Ghana, to get some Bibles and some uh, stuff for kids. Okay. Some like Bible cartoons, uh, magazines for kids to color and stuff. So, if you can't get a Bible, email this ministry. I'll do my best to get Bibles to you. I'm a ministry. <laughs> they think I'm a huge ministry. I had to explain it to them. I'm just one man. Okay, I'm just one man, praise God, that loves the Lord, loves His Word, and is doing my best to serve Him with, with the gifts and the... Um, resources, try to think of the right words, resources that God has given me. So letter is from us. The day is at hand. Okay. Notice I said the day is at hand. Get your King James Bibles and open to, Revel to Romans 13. Romans 13. Like I said, I got into this with the brother in Christ and I might have lost fellowship with the brother in Christ because I believe the day of Christ is at hand at th uh, th Second Thessalonians. Paul's being serious. He's not saying someone else is writing, and we're going to prove that, that someone else is writing letters and putting my name to it, and therefore it's just that it's a false teaching to teach that the day of Christ is at hand, that we're supposed to be looking present tense for that blessed hope, that we're supposed to love the, the appearing of our great God and Savior, which means you're looking for it if you love it. If you don't love it, you're not looking for it. And as we get through this, we're going to find out it's not about words, brothers and sisters Christ. Brethren are falling away and they still teach. Well, I still teach that the body of Christ goes up before the time of Jacob's trouble, falsely called the Great Tribulation. And it's not a rapture. There's no such thing as rapture. It's caught up. And that event's actually called the Day of Christ, which we're going to get into here. It's called the Day of Christ. It's called the Blessed Hope. Why do we have the... I, I was... As a false convert, I was in these Babel buildings. Why is it the Babel buildings have the hardest time using the words that God chose and saying things the way God says them? Why is that? And you wonder why there's a huge exodus leaving these Babel buildings. Okay. Romans 13. Let's get over to Romans 13. Why? Because they're not following the Bible. There, there's, there's a lot of lost people coming into the battle buildings, and a lot of saved people are leaving the battle buildings. Why? Because they're not lining up with the Word, and they're not getting fed. I, can keep, I don't mean to go off too much, brothers of Christ, but it just seems like even good Bible-believing ministries that were online, YouTube, they're becoming talk shows. Have you noticed that? They become reaction shows. Well, this happened, and this is what I feel, and this is my opinion, and, and this and that. Oh, I better throw in a few scriptures here and there. What happened to the solid Bible teaching and Bible preaching that we used to find on YouTube? What happened? 
They're becoming talk shows, reaction shows, gossip shows, political. They get into politics and they become political. Now, I understand what's one of the other words that God put in my heart. Um, conspiracies. I understand conspiracy is a Bible word. But you have some of them that get so stuck in worldliness and conspiracies of the world and everything. It's like, we need to get back to preaching the word. You can do a study on conspiracy, but don't make your whole ministry about it. Make it a talk show and everything. Get back to being Bible teaching and Bible preaching. We desperately need that. Um, I've always I've been warning the brethren, go back and watch old studies. If you want to find good Bible teachings, you're going to have to go back to the old days. Okay, King James Video Ministries before Brian fell away. Uh, I, I say Peter Ruckman, when he's doing the uh, expository, his, his um, audio tapes on the expository studies, and his question and answers, if you want actual Bible studies. If you want just some preaching, that, uh, good preaching with testimonies, then that's his chalk talks. But if you stand there and say, Peter Ruckman chalk talks, that's the best Bible t preaching ever. You, you, you don't know what Bible preaching is. That, that's not Bible studies. That's not preaching the Word. He, he's telling stories a lot. He's using uh, worldly wisdom. Like, th uh, he'll use, uh, you know, smart phrases. I'm trying to think of the word. Philosophy. World's wisdom. The, the world's way of saying things. Like one in the, I forgot what that was, like one in the bush is better than two in the hand or something like that. And he starts quoting worldly wisdom. And he says, well, there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of, no, there's absolute truth in this. Try quoting this. And he does. He does. I'm not trying to kick him, but I'm just saying, if you really love Bible studies, brothers and sisters of Christ, then it's going to be comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. Turn here, turn there, turn here, turn there. And it seems like in these last days, brethren don't want Bible studies. They want talk shows. They want reaction shows. They want gossip shows. They want, um, what do you call it, uh, drama where they're attacking. We, I like watching when they attack this person or that person attacks that person. Brothers of Christ, you need to get back to this. Okay? You need to get back to knowing this. Some of you used to know this really well, but you've drifted away. I put out those pictures about Bibles where they had dust on them saying, read me, read me, you know. This is gathering dust and you're starting to forget it. You're not hiding it in your heart anymore. Like the Bible said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And it's always a heart issue. Are you keeping up with this? Are you refreshing your memory with good Bible preaching and Bible teaching? The doctrines, instruction, and righteousness. Are you staying in this every day, brother and Christ? Starting your day with it, ending your day with it. Are you praying without ceasing? Are you praying over this book? I just, I'm just frustrated because I'm losing brethren to the world and distractions of the world, to the flesh, to the world, and all the distractions that come with it. All the temptations and distractions. And I'm losing brethren. And we need to stop fighting over little things. We can disagree. Like I said, we should always understand when I say we can disagree, I mean there's going to be times we are, I understand, there's going to be times that we disagree, brothers and sisters Christ. Now, the Bible says we're supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment. Should we be disagreeing? No, we should all be on the, of the same mind and the same judgment. We should all be on the same... I can't grab it, but page. We should all be on the same page. We should all be having the same foundation. Okay? But maybe God hasn't shown you the truth that He's shown me yet. And maybe He hasn't shown me the truth that He's shown you yet. In other words, there's times where I was like, I, I, this has to be the way, this has to be the way. And I've had some brethren try to tell me the truth. And I was like, I don't know, Lord, I don't know, I don't know. And uh, along the way, in my own reading, God says, see that, see that, they were right, see that, they were right. And the same thing with you when I'm preaching to you. Some of you are fighting, butting heads with me. It's like, stay in the Word of God and keep praying over this book. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given to him. Pray over this book. Okay. But we still need to love one another. Okay. So I had a brother in Christ, we had a disagreement. And here I'm going to go over another study, and it might be like another study we've already done, but I want to do it again because, and, and hopefully I've put in some new stuff. Okay. Sometimes we do a lot of preaching and teaching, and uh, we, we kind of don't, it's kind of foggy what we taught. I've been doing this for six years now. 
what I taught six years ago, five years ago. That's why we have to keep teaching the same thing over and over to keep it fresh in our hearts. You've got to keep watching good Bible studies over and over to keep it fresh in your heart, brothers and sisters of Christ. But Romans 13, okay. Now, if you want to pause the video, read Romans 13, uh, verses 1 through 10. Okay, some of these things, as you read through here, for the rulers are not a terror to good, for this is the ministry of God. God is a avenger of, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Pause and read all the way through this. It's talking about the life that we live down here. When you get to verse uh, 7, Render therefore to all the, their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now stop right here, real quick, a little side note. There's some brethren that are getting in there saying, where does it say I have to love the lost world? Right here. No, no, that's just brethren in Christ. So I can owe the lost world, but I just don't have to owe a brother in Christ? Verse 9, for this thou shalt not commit adultery. I just don't commit adultery with the body of Christ, but I can commit adultery with the lost world. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Thou shalt not kill. As long as I don't kill a brother in Christ, I can kill everyone else. Like these false religions out there that are all about the sword. The Bible says, if you live by the sword, you shall die by the sword. We can defend ourselves, but we're not to live by the sword. Thou shalt not kill. No, that includes everybody, saved and lost. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehend, comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The neighbor is just your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's sometimes where it's talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ. But in this passage, I believe it's talking about everybody. The pe neighbor is someone who lives around you. Someone that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Face-to-face -face dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Thou shalt love thy neighbor with thyself. No, that's only saved people. Then everything else we just read there, is that only for saved people? It doesn't apply to the lost? You see how people can get really messed up? But it's just Christ, the body of Christ, it just seems like we're developing a, such a hate for the lost world. I hate evil in the lost world. I hate the sin and wickedness in the lost world. I hate how bad this world has gotten. How far away from God it is. Not even close. They're, they're just purposely going out of their way to do everything that's the opposite of how God says things are supposed to be done. I'm frustrated with the condition of the body of Christ. I'm frustrated and upset at my own faults and failings when it comes to my Lord and Savior. But we're still supposed to love the lost world, and you love them by preaching the truth to them. You love them by being a living witness how you treat them. How do you respond to them? You don't reward evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. The Bible teaches. They mock you, you don't mock them. They spit in your face, you don't spit in their face. They steal from you, you don't steal from them. They call you names, you don't call them names. See where this is going? We're supposed to be a light to this dark world. We're supposed to be separate. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. But some of the brethren are trying to push this thing where you don't have to love the lost world. Nah. True love for them is preaching the truth to them and being a living witness how you treat them. So they know that, hey, I'm not your enemy, so then they'll listen to your words. I'm not your enemy. Listen to your words when you preach the truth to them, so they'll listen to you. If you come out acting like their enemy with your actions, they're not going to listen to your words. But let's keep going here. Verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, I've said it before, and I'm learning more, like I said, I'm learning all the time. But in the Old Testament, when it says, love thy neighbor as thyself, it's just the Jewish people. But I've gone through the Old Testament so many times, it talked about those that are foreign to the land. Those that are strangers living among you. Because there's, pe there's people that have bond servants, and there's people from Egypt that came up with them, out of Egypt. Egyptians that came with them. Okay? They had strangers in the land. 
that were dwelling in the land that included them when it says love your neighbor as yourself. I'm all for correction. Please, but if I'm wrong, correct me. But this whole push that when it says love thy neighbors yourself, that's not talking about the lost world. I fell for that. It's only talking about Christians. No, it's talking about everyone that's around you. You're to be a living witness and a verbal witness. And here we go. Verse 11. We can get back to the point of the study. But I just, when you read that, pause and read solid 1 through 10. It's talking about how we live down here for Jesus Christ. And what motivates us to obey this and live this. Verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Every day is a closer to, be, to going home. Brother says, Christ, I lay in bed at night and I say, thank you, Lord. Did I have a good day? Did I have a bad day? If I had a bad day, I'm like, Lord, please forgive me. I failed you here, 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 here. Lord, I just had a really bad day. Lord, please forgive me. Help me get, stay away from this stuff. Whatever I'm doing wrong, help me to fix it. And thank you, Lord, this day is over. Tomorrow's a new day. There's that kind of prayer. There's also the prayer of, even if you did right by the Lord that day, there's always something, that, like my thoughts wandering. But I say, Lord, we had a good day today. Lord, we stayed in your word. We got to go out. We did gospel tracting. Lord, we did this. We did that. Lord, it was an amazing day. Lord, you got me through another day. Praise God. We're one day closer. It's one day less that I have to go through before I get to be with my Lord and Savior. How do we know that? Our salvation is nearer than when we believe. Verse 12. The night is far spent. The night. Now, we're not going to get into this too much, but I was listening to a study by Peter Ruckman. I've been listening to a few lately. And he talks about, and I agree with him, that when it talks about us being a light to this dark world, we're in the night. He says that the time of the Gentiles is, is nighttime. We're in the night. And the day's coming. Okay, the day of the Lord, when he's coming back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. But right now, we're in the night. And we're supposed to be a, a, a light in this dark time. You know, at night, you use lights. I took my light back in the other room. You use a light to see at night because it's too dark. Right? The night is far spent. That's what we're in. Paul, Paul, people always say, and these teachers that have turned their back on looking for that blessed hope, so they, they sometimes call it the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Yes, it doesn't say imminent return, but it says looking present tense. We're to look for it every day as if it could happen today. Paul says here, the night is far spent. What do you mean by the night is far spent? We are in the night, the time of the Gentiles. In other words, the time of the Gentiles could end any day now. Right here, the next part. The day is at hand. The day. We get caught up and go home. The day is at hand. Let us therefore, let us therefore, it's supposed to be motivation, cast off the works of darkness. We're supposed to be a light. If you're doing the works of darkness, you're not going to be shining for Jesus Christ. God's not going to be shining through you. Remember, you're supposed to be a living witness. Today, the big push and this false uh, gospel out there of easy believism, they take repentance out, they take prayer out, they, they say there is no changed life after salvation or there doesn't have to be a changed life. There's, that's their way of saying there does, there's no changed life. You can continue walking in darkness and doing the works of darkness, looking like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world, and just call yourself a Christian. And that's what we're seeing in the world today. And when you start backpedaling, and Paul saw this in Corinthians, he talked about, right, he questioned their salvation. But how can you be a light to this dark world if you look like them and act like them? You're supposed to be set apart from them. You're supposed to be a living witness. They're supposed to look at you and see Jesus Christ. They're supposed to see an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Cast off the works of darkness. You get saved and born again. You're a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Sanctification, we talked about this plenty of times. Someone who's truly a Christian in Christ. They say follow Christ. No, in Christ. I've made that mistake. Follow Christ. No, Christian means in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're a Christian according to the King James Bible. What does it mean to be in Christ? He made us unto us wisdom. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And a good understanding have all they that keep His commandments. So it starts with the fear of the Lord. starts with, I mean, the wisdom that God gives us is we fear God. That starts before salvation. Fearing God and coming to Him in repentance. Broken heart and a contrite spirit, having sorrow in your heart for sinning against God and the cost of sin. Right? But with true wisdom starts with fearing God, and because you fear God, God, you command me, I obey. It ends with keeping His commandments. Then it talks about righteousness, being an ambassador for Jesus Christ, being a light to this dark world, sanctification, getting sin out of your life. Sin gets in the way of your walk with the Lord. It gets in the way of wisdom. It gets in the way of righteousness, you know, being a good uh, ambassador for Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation. It gets in the way of everything sin does. So that's why sanctification is one of the four tests, are you in Christ Jesus? And then the last one, which is what we're talking about here, is redemption. The motivation that motivates us to have wisdom, that motivates us to be, for God's righteousness, to shine through us, be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Jesus' righteousness shine through us. And sanctification, redemption, we're looking for that blessed hope. Cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Do you know how you shine? How you shine the most. Ephesians 6.10. Okay, Ephesians 6.10. Finally, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. How do you shine the most? When you're putting on the whole armor of God. You know when you don't shine the most? When you forget to put on the armor of God? Or you get deceived in taking off the armor of God? <laughs> the helmet for a hope of salvation. Are you looking for that blessed hope? And you got brothers saying, Oh no, Jesus isn't coming back any day time soon. Paul was never looking for Jesus to come back in his lifetime. And, and you know, we've got four or five more years. You can take off that helmet for a hope of salvation. And some of you are falling for it. And you've taken off the helmet. You put down your shield of faith. Let's keep going here. That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil gets you to take the armor off. Why? Because then he can deceive you. Then he can distract you. Then he can basically make you a worthless Christian. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Be careful of ministries that are all about just pointing the finger everywhere else and calling everyone else out and fighting everybody. How often are they actually preaching and teaching this? I, there's some ministries, I don't believe are godly ministries, where they're just, all they all are is just calling everyone and anyone out. And they're just all about, you know, gossip and backbiting and whispering and, and so on and so forth. It's a good shepherd will call out false teachings and try to warn you about wolves in sheep's clothing? Absolutely. But their ministry primarily should be preaching the Word. Helping you put on the whole armor of God. Okay. Oh, I forgot to unplug it. Forgive me, brothers of Christ. This is more important. Are they preaching the word? Are they get are they help motivating you to put on the whole armor of God? Are they motivating you to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope? Are they motivating you to read the word of God every day, pray every day, live the word of God? All right. Or are they too busy fighting what's going on in the world? The world, the world, the world. And they're not showing you how to put on the whole armor of God so you can withstand. Remember, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for he wrestles not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. What's the time of the Gentiles? It's night. We're in the night time, the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Brothers, says Christ, when 
We get called home. That day is at hand. When we get called home, are you going to be in a standing position? Or are you going to be falling flat on your face? We've talked about this a lot, and sometimes, brethren, we start to forget. We've got to refresh our hearts. Are you going to be in a standing position when we get called home that day? The day that's at hand? Will you be standing in the evil day when God calls us home and starts the time of Jacob's trouble? Or are you going to be falling flat on your face? Thess 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.6 1 Thessalonians 5.6 Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Watch? What are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope with the life that we're living. We're supposed to watch and we're supposed to be sober. Here's the sober part. Remember what the Bible says? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil go around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Put on the whole armor of God so you don't get devoured. Keep looking for that blessed hope. Keep shining. Brothers says Christ, are you shining? Are you putting on the whole armor of God? For they that sleep in the night, and they be drunken and are drunken in the night, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Breastplate of righteousness, which is of faith and love, you now in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, our feet are shod with the preparation of peace. There's some men out there that, oh, I, I preach the gospel, but they really turn people away from the gospel because they have no love for anybody but themselves. And they've turned the ministry into a money-making business. And people, we need to breastplate of faith and love. Oh, in seriousness, we can, we can speak with authority because we have authority. And sincerity and in truth... We're supposed to be serious, we're supposed to speak with authority, but our motivation is supposed to be out of love. We want to see people get saved and born again. When I correct a brother in Christ, it's out of love. I want to see you get back up into a standing position. So when God comes back, we're all standing. Now when God comes back, I believe there's going to be a lot of people that are, brethren, that are face down. Falling flat on their face. Are you going to be one of those brethren? Are you going to be standing? Verse 9, the helmet for hope is salvation. Verse 9, for God, I, real quick, I believe that's the first part of the armor that they get you to take off. Well, maybe the second. The shield of faith is usually the most important because you have to have faith in that blessed hope and looking for it. So they get you to take down the shield. Well, maybe Paul wasn't really looking for it. Maybe, you know, we shouldn't be looking for it. But that helmet is usually the second, first or second piece of armor that gets taken off. And then everything else starts coming off. The, the breastplate of righteousness. The feet shod with the preparation of peace. You're supposed to gird your loins up with truth, the word of truth. You stop studying this. You stop reading it every day. You take off the whole armor of God. Okay, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. For a helmet, the hope of salvation. It didn't say a hard heart. Didn't say pride, didn't say ego, didn't say hate. It says faith and love. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, the time of Jacob's trouble, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Are you looking for that blessed hope? The day is at hand. People say, oh, it didn't say the day of Christ. I believe he's talking about it. Let's keep going here. What is that day, the days at hand, that we should live together with Him? Turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men in the time of Je Je the Gentiles. Why is it called the time of the Gentiles? Because in the Gospels, when the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is being preached, it's only for the Jewish people. That gospel is only for the Jewish people, and salvation is of the Jews. They rejected their king, crucified him, had him crucified. We have no king but Caesar. They rejected their king. Salvation went out to the world, which is why Jesus calls this the time of the Gentiles. That's why Paul called it the time of the Gentiles. Okay. Right. 
Romans 13. Keep your finger there. I got to go back to Romans uh, 13, 11. We read it, it says, put on the armor of light. Okay. Verse 12 says, the night is far spent. The night is far spent because we're in the night. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, not in strife and ending, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Looking for the, Once again, looking for that blessed hope is living a life of Christ. He could come back any day now. When he comes back, are you ready? When he comes back, how is he going to find you? In a standing position or falling flat on your face? Titus 2.11, we'll start all over. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Or in the time of the Gentiles, where salvation went out to the world. Anybody can get saved. Now when you get saved, for spiritually speaking, when you get saved, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. For we are all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Salvation has appeared to all men. Anybody can get saved today. Verse 12, teaching us, who's the us? Saved sinners. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Notice there's a dot comma. So it made a statement. But, there, but it's, it's linking it to something else. What is it linking it to? Verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. What does it mean to look for that blessed hope? I've said this before. I sit outside. I look up in the sky. And sometimes I ask the Lord. I said, when's the last time anybody's... People hardly look up anymore. Have you noticed that, brothers and Christ? They're just going around like so distracted by this world. By the flesh and worldliness. They hardly ever look up anymore. But looking for that blessed hope isn't, this, isn't looking up in the sky and saying, Okay, Lord, is today the day? Looking for that blessed hope is living every day. And then when you look up, you say, Lord, am I ready? If you came back today, would you say, Well done, thou good and faithful one, faithful servant? Or would you shake your head and be disappointed and say, Come on up? Yeah. Yeah. Looking for that blessed hope, that day, believing that it could happen any day, is supposed to be a motivator, because that's what the Bible pushes, to live right. To be in a standing position when Jesus does come back. I don't know when he's going to come back. He could come back today. He could come back tomorrow. He might not come back in my lifetime. But I'm supposed to live every day as if he could. And be ready. And that teaching is being is slowly disappearing, the true teaching, and getting replaced with get distracted by the flesh, get distracted by the world. It's not a big deal. God's not coming, Jesus is not coming back anytime soon. And and even from great men of God who used to vehemently defend the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ, looking for that blessed hope, the evident return of Jesus Christ, the attitude that he could come back any day now. You now understand the Bible doesn't say imminent return, but it says looking. As the day of the, that day is at hand. The day is at hand. Jesus could come back any day now. Therefore, cast off the works of darkness. And put on the armor of light. Get busy living in Christ Jesus our Lord. Living a life of Christ. 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. When do we get redeemed from all iniquity? At the catching away of the body of Christ. When we get caught up in life or in death. But we still have to deal with this wicked body of flesh. I'm a saved sinner. That's why in the book of John it talks about if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins and, and, for, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm still having to confess sins and repent and turn. Repent is the heart issue. Turn is the physical action. People always say they're one and the same. No, they're not. Repent and turn from your wickedness. Repent happens in the heart. Broken heart, contrite spirit. Having godly sorrow for sinning against him, what you did wrong. And then turn is getting it out of your life. Getting your, getting your life straight. Your heart's right with God now. You're going to get your life right with God. 
Okay. That he might redeem us from all iniquities and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We go home to be with the Lord. We get new bodies, which we're going to read about here in a bit. And we get to start serving God. Fully and completely, nothing gets in the way. This, we won't have a wicked body of flesh getting in the way. We won't have this wicked world getting in the way. Satan won't be getting in the way. I look forward to that day, brothers and Christ. Are you looking forward to that day? Are you looking for that day with the life that you're living? Romans 13, 11. I'm going to reread it again. And that knowing the time that now is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the whole armor of light. I wanted to go through real quick and talk about the armor of light, what it means to be standing, how to shine, and what motivates us to do that. That day is at hand. Okay, our salvation nearer than when we believed. Right. Philippians 2.12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not all as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What's that? What does it mean by our salvation is nearer than when we believed? You have people that don't believe in um, what they call eternal security, but that you're sealed. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have the everlasting life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. They're saying, well, you see, you, you, you can't really know that you're saved, and that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about salvation in this life. You've got eternal salvation, and you've got temporary salvation. The Bible talks about our life down here is the blink of an eye to God. A day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. This is temporary. And the Bible talks about time again that the struggles and the hardship that we go down here are not to be compared to what awaits for us up there in heaven. But we go down here in this temporary life is nothing to be compared with the, the eternal life that we're going to be living with our Lord and Savior. And some brethren are getting stuck on the temp temporal, the temporary, the physical down here. They're forgetting about rewards in heaven. They're, they're forgetting, like, they keep acting like this is our home. No, this is my home away from home. My real home's up there. Your real home, if you're saved and born again, is up there. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's our home up there. So we're trying to survive down here, and our life as a Christian in the time of the Gentiles, okay, the, with, with the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, it's not falsely called the church age. It's not the church age. But once again, I get frustrated. Why are these battle buildings doing everything they can? Because they're infected and diseased with the spirit of the world. That's, that antichrist spirit that sh that's already in the world today. That yea hath God said, a better rendering would be. It's not called the church age. It's called the time of the, we're in the time of the Gentiles, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Salvation went out to the world. But the moment we get saved, to the point where we get caught up, here it's, it's, it's the salvation that this is talking about. Our salvation in this life. Some brethren can really wreck their life. That's why it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Some brethren can really make a mess of their life. The hardest times I've ever gone as a saved sinner, the hardest times in my life that I've gone through, is because I screwed up. I made a stupid decision. I went down the wrong path. And God saved me and got me back to the right path. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Romans 8.13 says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if, through the, but if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now stop. If ye live after the flesh, I believe it's for everyone, but he, who's he really talking to? The body of Christ. That's the ye. If ye live after the flesh, he's preaching to the body of Christ. Ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. The salvation being talked about here is the salvation in this life. The life that you live for Jesus Christ. I was talking with the Lord. There's a difference between suffering for Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about if we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. 
There's a difference between going through tribulation and these days going through hardship because the world's against us. And Jesus said, if they hate you, know that they hated me first. They hated him first before he hated us. And it's not that they hate us, they hate him. Persecution's one thing. But when the world's destroying one another and you've got natural disasters and everything, God can protect us through that. The world can just devour one another and we're sitting here doing the work of the Lord. I've seen it. God saves us. God saves me in, in this life as a Christian. From the wicked world when they're devouring one another. From the bad things that happen in the world. Sometimes you can still go through stuff. But the point is, is salvation is life. If I'm living right and I'm doing right, God's watching over me. If I'm doing wrong, God's there to chasten me. To get me back on the right path. I don't want to go into too much, too much, but there's times where God doesn't really have to do much to someone who's truly saved. When I get to doing things, making bad decisions, I'm already convicted and I'm falling on my knees saying, Lord, I just did something stupid or I'm doing something wrong and I made a bad decision. I'm going down the wrong path. Lord, I need to get back on the right path. Help me. And I come falling to his knees. He doesn't really have to whip me <laughs> as a father would a child to get him back on the right path. But sometimes he does. Sometimes he does. But if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Sin gets in the way of you keeping the whole armor of God on. Tries to get you to, put, to take off the whole armor of God. Sin gets in the way of your walk with the Lord. Sin is destructive to the flesh. Okay? Work out your own salvation. Our salvation is nearer than when we believe. Our salvation from this life. Getting caught up. People say, well, that day is not being caught. That day, the, the day that's at hand that's talking about in Romans 13, 11, it's not talking about the blessed hope. It's not talking about the day of Christ. Yes, it is. And here's Paul saying, the day is at hand. He's looking for it. He's living every day as if it could happen today. And he's preaching that everyone else does it. He's setting the example, and we're to follow that example. Paul says, be followers of me as I am of Christ. Follow us as you have us for an example. Romans 14.10 we read, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Our salvation is nearer than when we believed. Every day down here is a day closer to being with our Lord and Savior in heaven. And we're supposed to be looking for it every day, brother, says Christ. Have you stopped looking for it with the life you're living? You say, well, how do you know if someone stopped looking for it? This starts gathering dust. You're not starting your day with the Word of God. You're not ending your day with the Word of God. You're not praying throughout the whole day. Starting your day with prayer and the Word and ending your day with prayer and the Word, but praying with God. Like, you're starting to get back into worldliness. Sin and wickedness, lust of the flesh. You're starting to get distracted by the world. You're starting to compromise. Going along to get along. You gotta give a little to get a little. All these worldly philosophy sayings. The Bible says we're to stand. Not don't faint, don't falter. We're not to be not be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. When you start conforming to the world and compromising, you start taking off that armor of God. You're no longer shining. You're no longer a light. You're no longer standing. That's so what that verse is talking about. Be not conformed to this world. You won't be able to prove. You won't, be, you won't prove that you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. People are going to look at you and go, wait a minute, you're not saved. You're just like me. Oh, is that what real salvation is? We don't really have to change. There's, no, there's nothing to it. Then you start creating false converts. But brothers of Christ, our salvation is nearer than when we believed. It's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. We get to go home and get and we get saved from this wicked body of flesh, from this wicked world, and we get to go home, and the judgment seat of Christ happens. Okay, that day, I believe, equals the blessed hope that we just read, and it equals the day of Christ. Okay? 1 Corinthians 1.8 says, Who shall also confirm you unto the end? What's the end of the time of the, uh, time of the Gentiles? What's the end of this time period? That you might be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We get caught up. The catch, they call it the catching away, but it's the day of Christ. That blessed hope. Where we get caught up 
before the time of Jacob's trouble, who shall confirm you to the end. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, begun a good work in you? The day that you're saved, eternal salvation, he saved you, he, that's when he begun a good work in you. That's when my life changed, when I got saved. And God started working on me. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, getting me to look for that blessed hope. He begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, we read in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, 8. Philippians 1, 6, will perform it until the day of Christ. God will keep working on you and keep doing it, trying to get you on the right path. If you lose your way to the left or the right, he'll get you back on the right path. If you're on the right path, he'll work with you and you'll learn so much. You'll have a, he'll teach you how to live your life. I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. He'll be your strength. He'll give you understanding. He's, he, he begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Christ, until the end, when he calls us home. He'll call us home in life or he'll call us home in death. Philippians 1.10 That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Brothers and Christ, are you sincere and without offense right now? Are you approving yourself? Remember Paul got on to the Corinthians. They were so looking like the world, acting like the world. They were treating the, what Jesus Christ did on the cross like a credit card. Oh, we can now sin all we want. Paul has to get on to him and say, Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He has to really get on to him. And he says, Prove yourselves. Okay, you need to prove yourself. Are you really saved and born again? Prove it. There's a saying that if you went to if you got put on trial today for being a Christian in Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And this is what the judge is going off of. And the judge is Jesus Christ. Not the respecter of person, the man you're following, not me. Not, not anybody down here. It's Jesus Christ. And this is the standard he's going off of. This is what he's judging. Would you be convicted? Or would you be set free? I don't know. There's just too many questions. I don't know. Let them go. A mistrial. I don't know if you know what a mistrial is, brothers and Christ, but it's when they can't agree one way or the other. And they, they call it a mistrial, and they either have to start all over, or the charges just get dropped. But it's a mistrial. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. There's, just, there's, there's stuff over here that kind of line up, and there's stuff over here that line up with the world. The Lord, the world, the Lord, the lukewarm. You know, the Bible talks about being lukewarm. Ah, mistrial. Or there's just so much evidence. Oh, he's not guilty. Let him go. He's not guilty of being a Christian. Let him go. Are you without offense till the day of Christ? And we always talk about being sincere. Is your heart in the right place when you're, when you're trying to preach this? When you're preaching the gospel, are you being sincere? I want to see you get saved. Or are you doing it trying to earn your way to heaven? Because there's people like Jehovah's Witnesses are out there just sitting there with all their stuff. I'm earning my way to heaven. They're gospel tracts, but they're false gospels. And it's Satan's church. They're just closet Catholics. But the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're just sitting there. I'm earning my way to heaven. They're not sincere. They're not. Their heart's not in the right place. Brother Jesus Christ says, your heart in the right place. Do you have a desire to see people get saved? I do. When a brother in Christ has fallen, do you have a desire to see him get back up? When you go to correct him in, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. In meekness. Having that sincerity and that desire to see him get back up on their feet. Brothers is Christ, Jesus can come back any day now. Are you on your flat on your face? Or are you standing? My heart's in the right place. I want to see you standing. I want him to look at you just as much as I want him to look at me and say, Well done, thou good and faithful one. Or are you trying to make excuses? Remember we did a study on justifying the men that starts justifying themselves before men and before God? 
Well, yeah, I know I probably should be playing those Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, anime, cartoons, satanic style music, or getting drunk, or, or whatever, uh, and on and on. But you start justifying it. God understands. You know, it's just, it's just hardship, and it's just, it, you know what, they're not really that bad. I mean, they're a little bit, but they're not that bad. And you keep talking to yourself, and they go from being, yeah, it's bad, I probably shouldn't do it, but it's, God, God understands, God will forgive me. Then it goes to where you try to defend it half and half, half bad, half good. Then you start defending it like it's 100% good. Have you seen those people? Some might be saved, some might be lost, but they're in the question mark. This trial, <laughs> question mark, I don't know. Because they're defending sin. They're defending worldliness. Are you going to be without offense? So this is Christ. I want this to motivate you to look for that blessed hope of the life that you're living. To get busy living for the Lord before it's too late. Stop getting distracted by some of these ministries. are distracting you by the world, the world, the world. There's nothing I can do about the wicked world out there. It's in God's hands. What can I do? I can do something about this man right here, the life I'm living, and how I deal with the people around me, my neighbors. Being a living witness and a verbal witness. We need to get back to Bible studies. We need to get back to hiding God's Word in our heart and living it. Stop being distracted by the world. Philippians 2.16 says, Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I had not run in vain, neither labor in vain. Remember what Paul said? We're supposed, to, we're supposed to be running a race as if only one receiveth the prize? We don't see that that often. Everyone should be running like, I better be busting my butt living for Jesus Christ and, and making sure that my life is clean, sanctification, uh, wisdom, making sure that I'm hiding God's Word and I know this book like I'm supposed to know this book, God's Word, and I'm hiding it in my heart, I'm living it, I'm being a... A righteousness. I'm being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. I'm being a verbal witness. I'm being a living witness. I'm being a light, putting on the whole armor of God so I can shine and be a light to this dark world. I need to be looking for that blessed hope. We need to be hurt. Why? Because as if only one receiveth the prize. Now we know when you study further that the judgment seat of Christ, every man will get the works that they have done. And all their works are going to be thrown on the fire, and anything that survives is theirs. But Paul says we're supposed to be running, and what he means by that is if one receiveth the prize, we need to be focused first and foremost on me, myself, and I when it comes to your walk with the Lord. I always say this, the first person you look at when it comes to correcting, you need to look at yourself. You need to make sure your walk lines up with the Lord. Now, there, that before you look at a brother in Christ, or a sister in Christ. Men in ministry, we're supposed to, that are, that being Bible teachers or Bible preachers, we're supposed to, you know, try to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We correct through the scriptures, but we just preach on what's wrong, and we preach on what's right, and you get convicted. That's the word I was looking for. Sorry, Lord, and thank you, Lord. Uh, convicted. We preach, and you get convicted. But the number one person we're supposed to be work, worried about when it comes to living a life of Christ and looking for that blessed hope is yourself, first and foremost. We're supposed to run as if only one receiveth the prize. Am I doing what's right? Am I living right? Am I pleasing God? Right. But holding forth the words of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither had labor in vain. Holding forth the words of life. Paul says, um, be ready, not Paul, Peter says in 1st, 2nd Peter, be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in you. We're supposed to be minister, uh, the, in the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, Our heartfelt desire is we're holding the word of life, we're living it, being a living witness and a verbal witness. So when we get to heaven, God looks at you and goes, You did well, thou good and faithful one. And you were able to rejoice. Oh Lord, rejoice. You get up there, oh, hey! Because we don't know, I don't know it now, if anybody ever got saved off of the videos uh, that God saved anybody through this ministry. Sometimes you can get to know, but all the gospel tracts that I handed out and everything, and laid out everywhere, when we get to heaven, oh yeah, I found one of those gospel tracts you laid out. We get to rejoice that we were doing the work of the Lord down here. That we were living for Him. 
that someone saw you and how you were living your life and not conforming to this wicked world, and they say, hey, that man had something I want, and it motivated them to find out, and they got saved because of the life that you were living for Jesus Christ. Well, God saves them, but you know what I'm saying? It got led to Christ. You get to rejoice. Are you going to be standing up there and be like that one guy? I know this is for the time of Jacob's trouble, but the guy, the parable about the guy with the penny that hid the penny and buried it, there's no rejoicing for him. He comes back, unburies it. Here's your one penny, God. Lord, here's your one penny. The other ones that made ten pennies, one penny, I think it was one penny made five, one penny made ten. I could get it back. But in other words, the Lord comes back and here's the increase. Here's the work I've done for you. Here's the life I've lived for you. Are you going to be one of those people, Christians, they call it, you barely get in by the skin of your teeth. You're just worthless as can be. And you're standing up there just a worthless Christian. You got in, but you didn't amount to anything. You won't be rejoicing. You'll have sorrow and be weeping because you go to the judgment seat of Christ. Here's your penny. Say, Jesus is just shaking his head at you. Here's your penny. I gave you every opportunity to do work, do good things for me, to earn rewards up in heaven, and you just was a worthless Christian. Here's your penny. Move it on. It's all that survived the fire. Ye survived the fire. Remember the Bible says uh, that if all of it's burnt off, ye, can, ye will survive as so by fire. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose rewards. A good Bible study that I have on this channel from Peter Ruckman that I liked was Things You Can Lose. I wish he had used more scripture on it, but that's for you and me. We can do that. We can do the Bible study. And I have, looking through the scriptures, on the things you can lose where the scripture talks about it. Are you going to be rejoicing when you get to heaven? That day of Christ happens and we get caught up. I may rejoice in the day of Christ. When the judgment seat of Christ happens, we get caught up. Are you, I have your, on my notes, are you going to rejoice in the day of Christ? Have you stopped looking for it with the life you are living, now living in Christ Jesus our Lord? Have you been distracted by the flesh? Temptations of the flesh, distracted by the world? Have you, have you been deceived by brethren that have fallen away? And they're getting distracted by the world and the flesh? Are you not putting on the whole armor of light? The whole armor of God, so you can shine? Now we get to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Thessalonians. It says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. We did a whole expository study on this. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the coming, they're looking for it. And by our gathering together unto Him, they're looking for it. What does it mean by gathering unto him? You don't have to turn here, but 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a comfort. Remember? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's a comfort. We get to go home. We get, we get freed from this wicked body of flesh. We don't have to put up with this wicked world anymore. But as we read that, Brother Jesus Christ, when it comes time, that trump, that's the, the noise of the trumpet, it's God's voice, sounds like a trumpet as he's calling us home. When he goes to call your home, it's... You can't go, oh, whoa, wait, wait, Lord, wait. I still got to do this for you. I haven't gone gospel tracting. I haven't been reading my Bible. I really haven't been praying. And, and oh, well, my house, I'm talking about this house here, but I'm looking at this house as an example. My house is very dirty right now, Lord, and I really need to clean it up and everything. And it's too late. It's too late. When he calls us home, we're going home. There's no time. And Paul says we're to live as if with, with, we're supposed to live every day as if there might be not any time. Jesus could come back tomorrow. What can I get done for him today? How can I live for him today? Did I start the day with the Word of God? Okay, I did. I start with prayer. Yes. Uh, walk and I walked and talked with the Lord. I did some good works with my hands around here. Got the garden I'm trying to get started. I got 
three, I got three levels of chickens. I got baby chicks out in the garage that just hatched, and I have medium chicks. I don't know what you'd call them, but they're in between a full-grown chicken and a baby chick. I got four of them down there. I've got uh, six, hen, uh, six hens and a rooster that I'm taking care of. I found out that some of the feral cats, I started feeding them, and they started taking care of all the, the rats. All the rats and mice are gone, praise God. I found out that one of them had kittens, has two kittens. I think one or two. I only saw one, but he might have more than one kitten. She, and she's sitting up there, so I'm having these things. Uh, you're doing good works with your hands. Uh, going for, wanting to go for, I went for a walk up the road, and I want to go walk on the beach today because we've had nothing but rain. And I've been praying for the Lord to go walk on the beach, grab my cue cards, and you go through your days. And what can I get done for the Lord? I'm praying for the brethren. We're doing this Bible study today, praise God. What are you doing for the Lord? What do you still need to get cleaned up? Lord, is there something I'm doing that's wrong? Am I living right? Am I still trying to justify sin? Am I still trying to justify compromise? Remember, conforming to this world. Is my priorities all messed up? There's a great brother in Christ that he was my mentor, that he was an amazing Bible teacher. But what happened to him? Slowly over years, one step in the wrong direction, one step, and that step is his priorities start getting all messed up. The, word, the Lord and His Word doesn't come first. He's a man called into full-time ministry, but the ministry and being a servant to his brothers and sisters in Christ don't come second. Everything else seems to trump those two things, and they, get, they take a back seat. Brothers and sisters in Christ, is your priorities all messed up? That's where love, the Bible says, love not the world. If God's word doesn't come first, God doesn't come first in your life, and his word doesn't come first, and the, and the brethren come second. Man in ministry, it's ministry in the brethren. If you're not called into ministry, it's just the brethren. Come second. But that's where the Bible talks about, love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love of the Father is not in him. You're not shining for Jesus Christ. The world's not supposed to come first. Are you asking yourselves these things, brothers and sisters Christ? Sanctification. Righteousness, remember? You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. God comes first. Command me, O Lord. What do you want me to do? How can I serve you better, Lord? And you might have a good day where you're doing great. Praise God. You might be having a bad day. But you can always turn it around. At the end of the day, you can pray to God and say, Lord, this was a bad day. Forgive me. Tomorrow, I want it to be different. I want it to be better. I want to serve you better. Make tomorrow a better day, Lord. You could come back any day now. Are you looking with the life that you're living? That was the whole point. And brethren, it's being stolen from us. You have wolves in sheep's clothing coming in trying to steal. Get, remember it talks about let no man steal thy crown? One of the crown rewards is that hope, uh, that helmet for a hope of salvation. Looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living. Loving the great appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're trying to steal your crown. They're trying to take that away. That desire to live every day as if Jesus Christ could come back tomorrow. They're trying to steal that from us. There are brethren that have fallen away. I'm putting over here at the computer, the YouTube, the YouTube channels where they've turned their back on it. Oh, Jesus isn't coming back for a few more years. They're trying to steal your crown. They let somebody steal their crown, and now they're trying to steal your crown. Are you looking for it? Yes, the day of Christ is at hand. Paul preached it. Don't fall for the deception. Don't be a respecter of persons. Don't take my word for it. I'm finding in all the Pauline epistles, there's times where he talks about, we could go home any day now. He acts like we could go home tomorrow. The catching away of the body of Christ could happen tomorrow. We read a few of those. We don't know what's going to happen, therefore you need to live every day as if it could happen today. Get busy living for the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2.1 Now we beseech you, brethren... Oh, we read that one, I'm sorry. We read all that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2 That ye be not soon shaken in mind... Or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter from us, but nor by word. We already did this in the expository study. We proved that what he's talking about here is 
There's people that are teaching that you miss the catching away. That's the not should shake in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word. People are coming and saying, hey, you missed it. It happened in the past. You already missed it. There's people saying, you don't get to go up. It's not going to happen. You're going to go through that time of Jacob's trouble. And we have a whole expository study on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay? But here's the thing, nor by letter from us, that's what we're talking about today, because that was the disagreement I got with the brother of Christ. I love him. But it says, nor by letter from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Well, see that as there? Someone's writing letters in Paul's name and signing his name, and Paul never said it. Romans 13, 11. And that, knowing the time, that now is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Get busy living for the Lord. We could go home any day now. Get busy living for the Lord. God could catch you up in death or He could catch you up in life with the day of Christ, that blessed hope. Get busy living for the Lord. Get busy, brothers, says Christ. Oh, no, no, Paul never wrote a letter like, yes, he did Yes, he did. Don't get stuck as the day of Christ is at hand. Yes, Paul teaches that that day is at hand. But you keep going through there, they're teaching that, like the expository said, they're teaching that they either missed it, or they're not. it's not going to happen, and they're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. They're fear-mongering him to get him away from the Lord and what Paul was teaching him, and get him over to doctrines of devils and heresies. What do you think the Catholic Church does? Fear-mongering. We read, I'm going, I just finished the Gospels, the four Gospels. You read how they would not confess Jesus Christ because they feared the religious leaders that they would get kicked out of the synagogue. Those religious leaders ruled with, by fear, like Nicolaitans, lording over the flock. And they used fear-mongering to get them to do whatever they said. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. The day is at hand. Don't let anybody steal that from you. That motivation in your heart. I'm living every day for the Lord, and every night I'm like, Lord, we're one day closer. This day's down. What do we got tomorrow? You know that song, that hymn that I put on this channel? It's called Climbing High Mountains, Trying to Find My Way Home. The whole point I put that out there, brethren, is that's how we're supposed to live. We're climbing this mountain with all our might, because on the other side might be the catching away of the body of Christ. And we get to the top of the peak of that mountain, and we look down, we see a valley, we see another mountain. Okay, Lord, that made this next mountain the last mountain. So you go down through the valley, witnessing, living the life of Christ, pleasing God, and you get up to the top of the next mountain. Okay, are we ready to go home? There might be another valley and another mountain. We're climbing high mountains, plural. Why? To make our way home. We're looking for that blessed hope every day. We're looking to go home to our real home, which is in heaven, not down here. We need to stop getting distracted on things down here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that day, what's that day? The day of Christ, the blessed hope. Shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man's sin will be revealed. You didn't miss it, and you're not going to miss it. We are going. When God calls us home, we're going. And it's going to be before the time of Jacob's trouble. That man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. Right now our body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. That's another good verse right there, how you're not going to miss it. When God calls us home, brothers and Christ, we are going home. We're not going into the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's an actual physical temple of God. They rebuild the third temple. Today, you are the temple. Your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. You're bought with the price. You're not your own. Your body is supposed to be without blemish. You are the temple. So right here... We're not going to be there for that. Showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? 
I almost want to read it again. Romans 3, 11. When he t uh, you got 1 Thessalonians, we read a little bit of that. But in the expository study, we showed a lot where he talks about it in other letters. But Romans 13, 11 again. And that knowing the time, that now is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. We're not going through the time of Jacob's trouble. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope, not that man of sin. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope, not the mark of the beast. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope, not the one world order. Not the one world currency. Not the one world religion. Not, uh, uh, I can keep going on and on. We're not supposed to be looking for that time of Jacob's trouble. And I'm saying this with frustration and anger because I know brethren that used to preach looking for that blessed hope and living a life of Christ, witnessing to people, sanctification, and, and staying in the Word of God, loving your brothers and sisters Christ, and now they've turned from it and they're preaching the time of Jacob's trouble. The world, the world, the world. And they're getting you distracted by the world. Paul said we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. Remember what I told you. And knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. It's almost over. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the whole armor of light. When you're pushing, that we're look, when you preach, and that's what I preach, looking for that blessed hope, what does it do? It motivates you to cast off the works of darkness and put on the whole armor of light. When you got these men that have turned from the Word of God and they're preaching the world, the world, the world, what does it do? It gets you to start fearing the world. And it gets you to start, I'm trying to think of the right word. I got canned food. It's uh, hunkered down and trying to set it, get prepared to go through hard, hard times because we got to endure to the end to be caught up because they don't want it to be shown their true colors. They're acting and living like post and mid trip. That they're having to actually go through the time of Jacob's trouble. And you've got to start prepping. Thank you, Lord. The word prepping. It motivates you to start prepping. It motivates you to start isolating yourself. And prepping and everything. Instead of living for the Lord fully and completely every day. Looking for that blessed hope. You're not casting off the works of darkness. You're not putting on the whole armor of light. Let no man steal thy crown. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Oh, we already did that. I'm sorry. Romans 13, 11 down here. 1 Corinthians 1, 8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end. What's the end? The blessed hope. The day of Christ. When we get caught up. That's what we're supposed to be looking for. That's our end. Remember we did a study on anything that has a beginning has an end? There's beginnings and there's ends. When we were born in sin, that was our beginning. We got saved and born again. The old man was crucified with Christ. That's the end of the old man. Now we have a new beginning. God gives us a new man. And our life down here. What's the end of that life? The catching away of the body of Christ. But we also get a new beginning when God gives us a new body. An incorruptible body. The, this corruption shall put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. And we start a new beginning. A new adventure, as I like to call it, with the Lord in heaven. But this says, who shall confirm you to the end? 1 Corinthians 8, 1, 8. The end of what? The time of the Gentiles being caught up, that you might be blameless at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6 again, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ, the end. God started a good work in you. If you're truly saved and born again, He started a good work in you. He can, it says here that He can He can, He begun a good work in you and will perform it unto the end if you're obedient. If you stay in this, stay in prayer. You keep doing your best to live right. When you fail, you repent, forsake, and you get back to your walk with the Lord. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow Jesus Christ. He says, follow me, but follow Jesus Christ. But like I said, there's some Christians that fall down, and they don't get back up. Philippians 1.10, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. 
And Philippians 2.16, holding forth the word of life, that ye may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labor in vain. I had a brother correct me because I kept saying it wrong. It says, not only preach the gospel, but I always say live the gospel. But it says live of the gospel. Of is connection. If you're saved by the true plan of salvation, there's going to be a life change. There's a connection. You're going to live like someone who got saved. You're not going to turn around and go back to looking like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world. That's a false convert. Like I said, they're brethren that can fall flat on their face. There's a change. The new man stays strong, and they go out there running 100 miles an hour, and they hit that first stumbling block, and they fall flat on their face, and some don't get back up. But there was a change. There was still a change. When there's absolutely no change, we're to live of the gospel. Okay, live. Brothers, this is Christ. The day of Christ is at hand in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the same day that Paul's talking about in Romans. It's the same day he's talking about in all these verses. 1 Corinthians 1.8, Philippians 1.6, Philippians 1.10, Philippians 2.16, and to the end. Don't be deceived. Don't be a respecter of persons. Don't take my word for it. Study the issue more. Read the Bible. Stay in this book. Know this book like you should know this book. Do not let Satan or his ministers or brethren that are fallen away get you to stop looking for that blessed hope of the life that you're living. The day of Christ, that blessed hope where we're going to get caught up and we're going to get new bodies and we're going to get saved, salvation from this wicked body of flesh, from this wicked world. And we get to go be with our Lord and Savior and so shall we ever be with Him, the Bible says. For that day is at hand, and you need to start living that way. You need to start believing it, and you need to start living it. Not just be all talk. Remember, you need to be walk. Talk and walk needs to line up. And that's how we're supposed to live. So, brothers and sisters Christ, I love you, my brothers and sisters Christ. I'm praying for you. Keep praying for me. Let's pray for the brethren that we get back to looking for that blessed hope with the lives that we're living, loving one another. Loving God's Word first. Remember, to love God is to, uh, is to take His Word and hide it in our heart and live it. If a man love me, he will keep my words. If you love me, keep my commandments. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Pray that we take this Word, we hide it in our hearts and we live it, and we show love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Love for God first. Taking His Word and hiding it. Love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, second. And love for this lost world, third. What's that? Preaching the gospel to them. Being a light, putting on the whole armor of God so we can shine in this dark day. And see people get saved. See brethren get back on their feet. And see us working together, having done all to stand. Whether it be of the same mind, the same judgment. Striving together. Don't faint, don't falter. Having done all to stand to be standing when Jesus Christ comes back. That's my fear. Will I be falling flat on my face? Because there's times I am. And there's times I'm standing. I want to be standing when God comes back. I want to be rejoicing when I'm up there. I want that for you too, brothers, says Christ. So we're going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next study.